All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Arvind. I've been told that this being the media lab, it's usual to expect some media problems. Uh, and so the, the slides are getting cut off a little bit, but hopefully you can still see what's going on. Uh, we're excited to show you this tool that we've built. Uh, we're, we're an academic team, but we operate a little bit differently from most academic teams. We do a lot of things that are not necessarily about paper publication. So this is an academic research project, but it is also an open source project. And this is Harry and this is Malta. Uh, they've been a, a key part of uh, building this tool, as well as uh, Stephen and Alicia are a couple of the other students. Um, <coughs> Uh, some of the other things we've done, we did an online course on uh, cryptocurrencies. So if my face looks vaguely familiar, that's probably where you've seen me. Uh, and a bunch of us, us others at Princeton as well got together to do that. And uh, we have a textbook as well. Uh, but today we're going to tell you about blockchain analytics. But before I say much about our specific tool, BlockSci, I want to take a few minutes to convince you that blockchain analysis is fun and interesting and can yield a lot of great insights. Uh, it just really quickly, were some of you at the uh, 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 MIT Bitcoin Expo a couple days ago? Okay, uh, a couple of you. So this is going to be a little bit repetitive, but uh, what we can do is we can make this interactive. Feel free to interrupt me at any time, and so hopefully it won't be too much of the same thing. So let's start with why blockchain analysis is cool and interesting. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Let me start with something that's kind of whimsical and might sound a little bit silly. Uh, but uh, this example is about finding transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain that have paid over $1,000 USD in transaction fees. So that might sound absurd. Why would a transaction pay such a crazy amount in transaction fees? But this is the kind of thing you can find very quickly in BlockSci. And if we plot that graph, we get this. Again, it's getting cut off a little bit. The x-axis is years. So these are more recent transactions. The y-axis is US dollars on a logarithmic scale. So somewhere over here is $1,000. This is 10000 And this is $100,000. And you can see up there, uh, there are a few crazy transactions that have paid a tremendous amount of money in transaction fees. So what happened there? <coughs> Why is this happening? Some of these were widely publicized examples. This one, for instance, was somebody who accidentally swapped the value and the transaction fee in the transaction that they created. And so they intended to transfer value equivalent to $137,000, but they accidentally made it a transaction fee. And of course, they lost that, uh, lost that value irrevocably. So this is an example of how Blockchain technology still has a lot of sharp edges. There are many, many ways to accidentally lose money, a lot of money. There have been uh, many examples of that. And this is, I think, a valuable lesson, the kind of things that blockchain analysis can reveal. Uh, so that was just one quick example. Let's get to something a little bit more serious now, something that might be familiar to a lot of you if you're in organizations with crypto assets. Let's say you're using best practices to protect your assets. So the situation might look something like this. You have a multi-signature wallet, and again, apologies for the slides here, that is being controlled jointly by several of the employees in your organization, Alice, Bob, and Carol, for maximum security. Uh, now, what might happen is, in the natural course of things, Carol might leave the company and Dave might come in, and now you want to transfer control jointly to Alice, Bob, and Dave. <coughs> right? And so the way you would do that, the way you have to do that, is to transfer all of the funds out of this wallet into a new multi-signature wallet controlled by a different set of three entities but overlapping with the first one. The key thing that I want you to observe about this transaction is that it's going to have to hit the blockchain. It's not something you can do privately on your own company's servers as opposed to traditional ways, uh, you know, traditional types of currency. And so this is going to be publicly visible to anybody, to researchers, to your competitors. So this is one example of how blockchain analysis can be useful for competitive intelligence. Uh, this is something that you might want to look into about other companies, but you might also want to be careful to try to minimize the amount of uh, information about your, the internals of your company that you're leaking onto the public blockchain uh, for anybody to see. And so you might wonder, is this actually, uh, is this, does this commonly happen? And there's going to be something at the bottom of the slide here that you probably can't see. OK, so I'll just say it verbally. Uh, it turns out when we did this analysis that something like 20,000 transactions per month expose internal confidential company information in this way on the public Bitcoin blockchain. 
So that is something uh, that you might not have expected that this is uh, so commonly going on. So here's a worse example. This is also something that we found frequently happening. A company starts with uh, multi-sig wallets controlled by Alice, Bob, and Carol and wants to transfer it to Alice, Bob, and Dave. But uh, perhaps because they don't realize that you can do this in a single transaction from one multi-sig wallet to another multi-sig wallet, what they end up doing is temporarily transferring control to an insecure single-sig wallet and then transferring that back to multi-sig over here. So this means that for whatever amount of time this is, an hour, a day, we found a range when we did this analysis, uh, you're losing all of the security benefits of multisig. If uh, an adversary, if a hacker knows that this is your normal practice, then uh, they might be looking for that opportunity to more easily steal your funds. And if it turns out that the, the device that you use to hold this uh, temporary single sig uh, secret key is compromised by malware, for example, then you pretty much lose all of the security benefits of multi-sig. So you might wonder, is this actually happening? Do people not know that you can go directly from here to here? It turns out that there are about 1,000 transactions per month on the public Bitcoin blockchain that we can observe uh, doing this exact pattern and weakening security in this way. So these are some examples of why you might need blockchain analysis. Let me give you now a list of six different reasons. Uh, you know, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a company with crypto assets, whether you're a cryptocurrency developer, or you're a student looking to learn more about blockchain technology, here are various things you can do. Uh, one is research. You can answer a lot of questions about how anonymous is a given cryptocurrency. We've used blockchain analysis, for example, to analyze Dash, which is a privacy-preserving altcoin, and found that their privacy claims are not quite as strong as, uh, as one, might, uh, one might think. Uh, we've used it to analyze Monero. That was not using Blocksci. Blocksci doesn't support Monero, but we've used other techniques. And the Monero developers have fixed uh, most of the issues that we found. Um, uh, we've used it even to analyze CoinJoin uh, that you can use today on Bitcoin. And we found that uh, it's, it's not quite as secure as you might think, given typical patterns of usage of coin, CoinJoin. And we're happy to talk to you more about that if you're interested in those things. But for now, I just wanted to very briefly say that there are a lot of research questions you can answer. What is the cryptocurrency being used for? Is it mostly speculation? Is it mostly everyday transactions? Those kinds of questions as well. You can use this for health monitoring of cryptocurrencies. Are the miners following the protocol? Are there dangerous things coming down the road? Are the incentives of the miners going to depart from what is best for the overall health of the cryptocurrency? And as I've just shown you, you can use it to answer a variety of questions about security, privacy, and confidentiality. Am I accidentally exposing internal company information on the public blockchain? You can use it for competitive intelligence. Uh, how much does a particular company's cold wallet currently hold? And first of all, can I identify the addresses associated with their cold wallets? These are things you can absolutely do today. We've talked to companies where we asked, you know, are you not worried that your competitors might be doing this? And they said, oh, that's too hard. We don't think anybody will bother to do that. We don't think that's the case. There's a lot that you can deduce just from the public blockchain. And tools like BlockSci uh, can help you to do that. You can use it to analyze theft, forensics is another example. And the last category is just for education. This is a very interesting and unique kind of data set. Uh, it's, uh, as you might know, the blockchain is a transaction graph, but it's different from other large graphs. It's not like the web graph, for example, or the internet graph. And so it's a fascinating data set to analyze, you know, to learn algorithms, but also to learn more about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. We've used BlockSci as an educational tool. Uh, we've developed a number of assignments based on that, and it's uh, generally turned out to be a very valuable learning experience for students. So a lot of reasons why you might want to use this thing. Very quickly, you might wonder, isn't this the kind of thing that companies like Chainalysis provide? Yes, there are many companies like Chainalysis which provide blockchain analysis tools. They're mostly focused on the forensics use case, and their main customers are law enforcement. Uh, what those companies target, and they're good at what they do, is very different from the problems that BlockSci is trying to solve. They kind of do all the analysis for you and give you a point and click interface, and so that's ideal for non-technical users, perhaps for people in law enforcement who don't want to be writing their own code. BlockSci's approach is very different. It allows you a variety of these things, for most of which you might have to write your own code and do your own analysis. You can't really do it through a point and click interface. 
Also, companies like Chainalysis spend thousands of person hours figuring out what are, what are Coinbase's addresses and what are each company's addresses. And that's a big part of the database that they provide to you. Uh, we don't do that. Blockside doesn't come bundled with that information. So if you have those address tags, you can put that into your instance of Blockside and get more use out of it. But uh, we don't try to do that for you. OK, so you might wonder if there are all kinds of cool reasons to be doing blockchain analysis. Why isn't it more commonly done? Why aren't there that many tools so far? Well, it turns out there are a few reasons. One is that just parsing the data is just painful. When Bitcoin Core or any other cryptocurrency peer-to-peer -peer node writes data onto the blockchain, it's not intended for analysis. It's intended for doing the basic functions of a cryptocurrency, making sure that the database is immutable and all of that stuff. So there's a lot you need to do to take that data and start working with it. Blockside does that work for you so you don't have to. So that's a big part of the problem that it solves for you. Uh, a lot of uh, previous tools have poor performance, and we're going to tell you, and Harry in particular is going to tell you more about why Bloxi is several orders of magnitude, literally faster than most previous tools. And uh, most tools we've, we looked at have a very cumbersome programming interface for interacting with the blockchain. And I'm going to show you how Bloxi makes it very easy. And there's, as you know, there's going to be a hands-on part of this workshop. We're not going to talk for too long, definitely less than an hour. After that, we hope that some of you will stick around to uh, uh, try writing code on top of Bloxi yourself. But just a very few lines of code, you can answer a lot of interesting questions, the kind that uh, a couple of examples of which I presented. So these are all problems that Bloxi solves for you. Now, one thing you might wonder is, you know, the blockchain is big data. And Bitcoin's blockchain alone is 160 gigabytes and growing quickly. So that being the case, how can we scale blockchain analysis? What is BlockSci's approach to this? In general, if you're working with blockchain data, what should be our approach to scaling, to making sure that our queries aren't going to take ridiculously long as blockchain data grows bigger and bigger? So if you think about this, when I, when I ask my students this, the first thing they always come up with is what I'll call sort of the received wisdom in the technology community, which is that if you want to do big data analytics, you want to use tools such as, for example, Hadoop MapReduce, where the approach is you take your big data store, you partition it into a number of nodes, you run queries over all of them in parallel, and then you combine the results. This is how we're used to thinking about data analysis on a large scale. And the reason that people use approaches like this is that there are two implicit assumptions behind this scenario. One is that you couldn't possibly do it on a single machine because your data is not going to fit in memory. And so, you know, uh, uh, what are you even going to do? And uh, the second is that it's going to be too slow to do on a single machine. You need to massively parallelize this if you want your analyses to conclude uh, within a reasonable amount of time. But let's think critically about these two assumptions. Is this actually true? Is this true? Is it true that blockchain data won't fit on a single machine in memory? And is it true that you can't do fast analyses on a single machine? So here are going to be some fun statistics for you. But first, I want you to test your intuition. If you were at my talk on Saturday, you already know this. But if not, I want you to try to guess. Uh, consider the amount of memory needed to process the current Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, you know, in an optimized in-memory representation. Think about how much that might be. And think about what you expect the largest amount of memory you can get out of a commodity Amazon EC2 instance. Try to guess which of these is larger. When I ask my students this, they'll usually guess that this latter is, number is going to be larger. They'll say it's something like twice as large. That's kind of the guess that they come up with. Uh, so it turns out they're right that the latter number is larger. You can get more memory out of EC2 today than you need to process the Bitcoin blockchain. But it turns out that the EC2 number is, in fact, between 100 and 200 times bigger than the amount of memory that you need to process the whole Bitcoin blockchain today in memory. So let me show you this visually. I'm going I'm to show you on the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Oh, yeah, this is not showing up well at all. So I'll just tell you what the numbers are. There's, uh, there's stuff on the left that you probably can't see. Let's start with this third number. Uh, today, the Bitcoin blockchain on disk is something like 160 or 170 gigabytes. However, you can turn that into an optimized in-memory representation. That's the first number. That's only about 25 to 30 gigabytes. I did, did these numbers a few months ago. They've grown slightly now. They haven't grown too much. Uh, and the reason that you can optimize it so much is because think about what the blockchain is full of. 
it's full of things like hash pointers. Of course you need hash pointers in a distributed system because you're referring to a piece of data that might be held by some other node somewhere in the system. But here we're doing analytics. We don't need things like hash pointers. We have all the data. We can convert hash pointers to actual pointers, right? And those are going to be far, far smaller than hash pointers. So if you think about a compressed memory representation, it turns out to be much smaller. And for a mere 66 cents per hour, you can get about a 60 gigabyte instance on EC2. And that is completely adequate, comfortable to handle blockchain analysis. But the max you can get is this number over here is about, I think it's uh, four terabytes uh, today. And I think even over time, this number is going to grow faster uh, than the blockchain is growing. EC2 releases larger and larger instances once in a while. Uh, and so that motivates our vertical scaling approach. We think that if you do the analysis on a single machine, I mean, distributed systems are great, but if you're doing analytics, if you hold all the data in memory on a single machine, then you avoid the massive overhead of having to pass data back and forth between different machines, all of that communication overhead. And that's the main reason that we get the massive speed up that we do. It's something that people just hadn't thought of. Everybody automatically went to the distributed approach, but when we brought it back to a single machine, we realized these several orders of magnitude speed improvements. So very quickly, Harry's going to tell you about how BlockSci is built. But uh, uh, what it does is there's uh, text here that you can't see that says raw blockchain data. And there's a parser that turns, out in, turns that into an in-memory blockchain database. And we provide a lot of analytics tools. A lot of the magic of BlockSci is in the C++ library and the Python library. And I'll give you some examples of the things that we've already built for you that you can use to uh, do blockchain analysis very succinctly. And your code is going to be sitting on top of that. So we have this kind of batteries included approach. A lot of the time you might want to cross correlate exchange rate data with what's going on in the blockchain. So we make it very easy for you to do that with a single command to download and parse and start using exchange rate data about you know, the, the minute to minute exchange rates of cryptocurrency with fiat currency or one cryptocurrency with another currency. Uh, and similarly, if you want mempool data that actually never gets recorded on the blockchain, uh, BlockSci can expose that for you as well. And we have an address clustering module. You, you might have heard of address clustering techniques being really powerful ways to find all the addresses associated with a particular person or company or entity and a lot of intelligence that you can get out of that. Uh, we do that for you. It's, uh, it's something we're constantly improving because it's a bunch of heuristics, uh, but it's, uh, uh, you, know, you have a starting point where you can already make use of everything that we've created instead of starting from scratch. Do you have historic snapshots of the mempool data? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. So I think we started collecting mempool data six months ago. Is that correct? Uh, we haven't been collecting uh, Yeah, and, 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 and in, in kind of a spotty way. So what I mean when I say that we collect mempool data is that the software allows you, when you start using BlockSci, to start collecting your mempool data. Uh, the data that comes bundled with BlockSci is only the blockchain data. It's not the mempool data. Uh, so I also want to quickly mention that some amount of mempool data is available from tools like uh, blockchain.info because they'll record the first seen timestamp of a transaction, for example. Uh, BlockSci supports uh, several different blockchains. We've worked with about six different blockchains, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, Namecoin, Litecoin, and uh, Zcash as well, or at least the non-encrypted parts of Zcash. But in general, any blockchain format that's kind of a transaction graph is supported by BlockSci. Uh, we don't support Ethereum, for example, because it's not a transaction graph model. It's an account-based model. And uh, uh, there are a few others that we don't support, but I, I would say we support the majority of blockchains. Another cool thing about it is that the interface, the default interface that you're exposed to, is Jupyter Notebook. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's a powerful data science interface. It combines the data with the code, with the visualization. Of course, we're going to show you. We're going to create accounts for all of you on our EC2 instances, and you can play with that if you're interested. So let me just tell you a few more things before I turn it over to Harry. Uh, the speed we've uh, achieved here is, here's an example. If you want to iterate over every single transaction, transaction input and transaction output on the current Bitcoin blockchain, of which there are more than 1.5 billion, it takes only 1.1 seconds on a, just a single core EC2 instance. Right, so when everything is in memory and it's laid out and it's optimized for uh, linear uh, uh, iteration, you get a lot of, out of it because 
Uh, you can just do you know, linear traversal in a second, so you don't need to worry too much about databases and indexes and all of that messy stuff that goes into traditional data analysis platforms. So this conceptually simplifies things dramatically for you and also gives you very fast access. Now, this is using our C++ interface. That's the one caveat. Our Python interface, uh, you can't see that there, is uh, slower, but it's still pretty fast, still faster than any other tool out there. But what we're trying to do, what we're going to be working on over the next couple of months, is building a layer for our Python interface where you write code in Python. And just like NumPy, if you're familiar with that, it takes your vectorized Python code and it pushes it down to a C layer and executes that uh, very fast and surfaces the data back to Python. Uh, we're going to be taking a similar approach in block size. So we hope that for most queries, you can write Python code and still get the speed of C++. We're gradually getting there. We're not quite there yet. Okay. So the reason we're so fast, 100 to 1,000 times faster than previous tools, one of the reasons for it is that we're giving up on all the ACID properties of traditional databases. When there are multiple readers and writers, how do you make sure that people can read and write concurrently and not corrupt data? All of that stuff, very complex logic that goes into creating a database. We don't need that. Why? Because that's the beautiful thing about blockchains. It's an immutable database. Once data is written to it, once you know, you're know you comfortable that a certain number of blocks ha have um, uh, have confirmed uh, the transaction, you know it's never going to change, so we don't need those traditional database properties. And here he's going to tell you about various other tricks that he did um, uh, in order to make this so fast. Now, one of the questions that people ask us about BlockSci, and it's a very valid question, is what is your query interface? What language do I have to learn to start doing these database queries and start analyzing the blockchain? So what, what interface is your database exposed? So uh, the answer to, my, to this question is my favorite part of BlockSci, which is that we don't have a query language. Uh, just use Python, that's our principle. And that's the coolest thing about BlockSci. You don't need to learn a new query language. You can use all of your familiar Python idioms that you're familiar with. For example, if you want to look at the transaction fee earned by each block, you can just write very natural looking query. Sum of transaction fees for a transaction in block for a block in a certain uh, date range in the blockchain. And you're going to uh, do this yourself. And it's you know, kind of the most natural syntax you can think of. And it works directly in block site. And it works really fast. In practice, you would use a very slight variant of this that's optimized for speed. So I just want to um, uh, uh, say one or two last things. I want to give you one example of a cool economic analysis that we were able to do using BlockSci. And what this is, is we wanted to compute how often are Bitcoins changing possession between people and, or, or entities. Uh, and you might know the concept in economics of the velocity of money. We wanted to calculate the velocity of Bitcoin. The idea here is that if people are using it for buying coffee at Starbucks and all kinds of other stuff, the velocity of money is going to be pretty high. Uh, assets are changing possession very quickly, whereas if they're mostly using it for speculation and for holding of an investment for long periods of time, then the velocity is going to be pretty low. So it's a metric that captures how the currency is being used. So how would you go about computing this? The simple way of computing it is simply looking at every transaction that's happened in a particular period of time and look at the value of those transactions and add them up and divide that by the number of Bitcoins in circulation. Right? So that gives you the average transfer of value that's happened in a particular period. But that won't work. The reason that that won't work is that, as you might imagine, a lot of what's going on in the blockchain is people just shuffling coins between themselves, sort of rearranging their wallets or transferring within their own uh, company or something like that. So we want to eliminate those types of transfers of value, and we want to be left with only the transactions that represent a change of possession from one entity to another. So because of the clustering techniques in BlockSci, we're able to do that. This is the, a graph of the naive estimate and this is for 2016, this is January 2017 through mid-2017. So if you do the naive estimate, simply look at all the transactions on the blockchain, you'll end up with something that's very spiky over here. The y-axis is tens of millions of Bitcoins uh, moved per day. And so this already suggests that something's wrong here because you wouldn't expect a typical you know, transaction volume of a currency to have such enormous spikes, right? So uh, something's wrong here. So if we apply our clustering heuristics and remove everything, that turns out to be sort of self-churn, people transferring money to themselves, we end up with something that's still an upper bound, but a much, much lower estimate and also a much more stable estimate. 
And what this turns out to is that each unit, each Satoshi, if you want to think about it that way, changes possession on average 1.4 times per month. That's the better estimate that we came up with. Um, and so if you compare that you know, with uh, what we would want out of a cryptocurrency, it's a little bit sobering. It, 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 using this graph and various other metrics, we argue in our draft paper that most of what Bitcoin is being used for today, and this might not come as a shocker to most of you, is that not being used so much as a medium of exchange so much, but more for speculation and long-term investment. Uh, so you know, these kinds of analyses allow us to understand how people are, what people are doing in terms of using blockchain data and help us to better figure out, for example, what our priorities should be as a community, what types of users should we enable, and that sort of thing. See, whenever a person wants to change uh, money to his own wallet, it's a different address all the time. So how exactly. Are you out, uh, the same person? Exactly. So that's what I mean by clustering techniques. What clustering techniques can do is use a variety of heuristics. For example, we can argue that here's a single transaction that takes this input both address X and address Y. So unless this is some kind of special coin join transaction, it means that X and Y are controlled by the same entity, and we can prog that, program that into. Uh, into blocks and we've done that. But the addresses are supposed to be totally random. The, every time you do it, uh, so, I mean, I, when I transfer any amount of um, amount of Bitcoin to anyone else, you know, or to myself, it's, it's supposed to be at you. Well, the only information that you're going to block is the addresses, which are supposed to be in the stream, so, you know. They're supposed to be, but uh, they're not in practice. It's not that the address strings themselves are distinguishable, but the pattern of use of the addresses are different. And so people have come up with a variety of heuristics to figure out, given a transaction, which of these is the payment to the other person, which of these is the change address back to you. They don't always work, but they work a lot of the time. Because I just wanted to look at the intuition, because I don't see any intuition to get into that. Because if I transfer, say, $25 worth of Bitcoin to myself or yeah. someone else, on the blockchain, it would look exactly the same. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so let me give you an intuition. So let's say your wallet contains two addresses, X and Y, and you're uh, now transferring, you want to consolidate your funds, right? So you take your uh, accounts, or uh, pardon me, you take your balance out of both X and Y, and you transfer it to Z, which is also an address held by yourself. So here are some heuristics we can apply. If X belong to you and Y belong to me, it's unlikely that we would come together and create a single transaction that combines those funds with each other. Because it would require a dance where you create a signature and then I would have to create a signature on the same transaction. Most wallets don't even support this. Right, so we can already guess that X and Y both belong to the same person. Here's something further we can guess. You took all of X and Y and you sent all of it to Z and you didn't create any change. If you were using both X and Y to pay for coffee, for example, it's very unlikely that you would have found the exact amount to make exact change and not have to send any change back to yourself. So we look at a transaction with no change and again we can guess that Z also probably belongs to the same person. So using these two heuristics, I've linked X, Y, and Z all to each other and we have something like eight to nine heuristics at this point. Yeah. yeah. Not all of which we're exposing through BlockSci because some of them are still at the research stage and we're improving them. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot that one can do. Did you say that after you wipe out some of that based on your heuristics, you think that the turnover is about 140% per month? Or it's uh, 1.4 times, yes, that each unit is changing possession per month. That's correct. So 140%. 140%, oh, that's a way to think about it, sure. Once you wipe out the yeah. itself, the, the, exactly. the uh, cross trades with yourself. Exactly. So I mentioned our uh, draft paper. Uh, if, you, if you Google BlockSci paper, it'll come up. If you're interested, feel free to look it up. Neha. Sorry, um, it's just that does not at all account for all of the transactions that are happening off-chain with an exchange. Totally, case. totally. I should have clarified that. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. So it's, it's, it's more the, the actual raw Bitcoin. It's o yeah, it's only what's hitting the blockchain. Have you been able to figure out what percentage of transactions are done via exchanges? or large exchanges versus individuals? That's a great question. Happy to chat with you more about that. We haven't tried to look into that. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, this is our open source tool, BlockSide. Just Google BlockSide GitHub, it'll come up. It's a, uh, it's a you know, pretty active open source project. A lot of people have expressed interest and have contributed bug reports and pull requests and so on. We're grateful for all of that. So before I turn it over to Harry, so if you want to get started using BlogSci, the easiest way is we've provided an AMI image. So if you're not familiar with this, you can use our uh, disk image and use that with your own EC2 account to spin up an instance that'll have BlogSci already 
installed for you, as well as the entire blockchain data. And you, you can directly access this Jupyter notebook that will allow you to interact with the blockchain in a, in a straightforward fashion. There's also uh, a way where you can install the software locally to your machine. But for today, for those of you who are sticking around, what we're going to do, you can't see that there. But what it says is you're just going to be using our EC2 instances uh, that we've created for you. So uh, you don't need to do any work except uh, go to uh, a form whose URL I'll put up on the next slide and just put in a preferred username that you want to use for that. Can I ask one other question? Please, yeah. The wash trades, meaning the self do you have a theory of the case on what motivates uh, two or three main reasons motivators for the watch trades? Sure. So one of them is simply change addresses. In other words, if you're paying for something you don't have exact change, you should come up with a, a set of coins that are actually worth more than what you want to pay and then return the rest back to yourself. Uh, some of it we think is people consolidating their funds. Um, hot wallet to cold wallet, cold wallet to hot wallet, all kinds of other stuff. And I think so, uh, and it, perhaps a third reason, not the main one, but still a pretty interesting reason, if there is a theft, for example, often the thief will try to uh, move money around in complex ways to their own addresses in order to throw off the tail of somebody who might be watching. And uh, we can actually visualize that, and we get some really interesting patterns out of it when we visualize it for how people are trying to obfuscate the trail of uh, stolen Bitcoins. So I presume that the, the canon terrorism forces around the globe, the FBI and everything, reads your heuristics and has their own as well. I'm sure, yeah. And, and again, so for the anti taps case, uh, you know, there are already uh, companies such as Chainalysis who are providing that service for you. That's not even the main use case we're targeting, but uh, it is something that one can do with BlockSci as well. So the takeaway is if you're in the cryptocurrency space, there, there are many cool uses of blockchain analysis that might be applicable to you. So I gave you about six use cases there. You know, I'm sure there are many others that uh, we haven't thought of. And uh, hopefully I've convinced you and you know, hopefully you'll get to try it out for yourself that BlockSci is a fast and expressive open source tool that you can use for this. Uh, and then my third point is just kind of an aside about data science. What we discovered in the process of building BlockSci is that this data science mantra of distributed analytics is just tremendously overrated. And we found that, I mean, don't get me wrong, distributed systems are great, blockchains are great, you know, consensus is great, all that is great. But if you just want to do data analysis, uh, we don't see a compelling reason for most workloads to do it in a distributed way as opposed to vertical scaling on a single machine in memory given that you can easily get an instance with something like four terabytes of memory. So the last thing I want to say is if you want to try out BlockSci after we're done speaking, uh, just go to this URL and just put in a username. And uh, that what that'll allow us to do is create accounts for you. There are no passwords. There's no security here. There's no sensitive data. Uh, but it'll allow us to uh, create accounts for you on our server. And later, we'll give you the URL for the server. You can get into it. And just with a web-based interface, you can start interacting with blockchain data. Try to put sort of a unique looking username because we're not even checking if you're putting in those things usernames. It's a, a very kind of hand-rolled setup with a Google Forms link here. It's tinyurl.com slash blockside, not case sensitive. OK, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Harry's going to tell you more a little bit about the internals of BlockSci and how it leads to a, an effective user interface for you.
slide. <laughs> I had time to change my slides while Armin was going. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Harry Kalotner. I'm the, the lead uh, developer behind BlockSci. And I'm going to talk uh, a little more detail about uh, what using BlockSci is like and uh, what sort of stuff went into the development. I'm also, uh, a little later on in the presentation, uh, I, I cover some more about the uh, clustering and, and cha change address identification heuristics. Uh, so hold on and uh, wait for that if you're interested. Um, so uh, yeah, we can dive right in. Um, so um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so kind of just uh, to start with, uh, and this was kind of like the mental process of creating BlockSci, what do we want in a blockchain analysis tool? Um, well, from a research perspective, one thing that we really want is we want to be able to ask big questions about how people use Bitcoin, um, looking up kind of some transaction by hash on, on you know, any one of many block explorers is, is nice. and. If you're just a, a Bitcoin user, that's really all you need. Um, but from an analytics and research perspective, you really want to be able to, to execute kind of queries and, and really kind of do stuff in, in bulk over the whole blockchain, which of course continues to grow. Um, you really want your tool to, to kind of to understand the blockchain. You don't want, there's, there's a lot of kind of depth that goes into understanding the Bitcoin protocol. And you want to be able to surface all of that in kind of nice intuitive ways. Uh, one of the big things in there is uh, handling uh, address types properly. And I'm going to go a little more into that later, but, but kind of in short form, that's, there, are many, there are a lot of different address types. There's pay to script hash addresses that begin with three. There's pay to pubkey hashes addresses that begin with one. Uh, but then there's also, I think BlockSci has uh, support for, for seven different address types. Um, so there's a whole lot of kind of understanding that goes in there other than just looking at the raw data on the blockchain. Um, and we want a nice interface, um, which people need to be able to use it. I, I, I coded the whole thing in C++, but you can't exactly expect people to, for any time they want to write a simple query, to compile code. Um, so we want to kind of hide all of the ugliness on the underside of the system and have the user experience be nice and straightforward. Um, so one thing you could do if you want to do analytics is you could just use the Bitcoin uh, core full node. It has a nice RPC interface. You can look up various things. Um, it's slow. It's RPC kind of sucks. If you want to query something about every transaction, it's going to take a really long time. I'm not sure how long because I've never had let my computer run for that long. Um, but it, it takes uh, forever. Um, and it's really, it's optimized for user wallets. I mean, the, the whole goal there is to be able to answer questions that users might want to know about their wallet. And, and also, for, in the case of Bitcoin Core, of course, to supply the security and, and validate everything. And if we're doing analytics across the chain, we clearly don't care about security because we can just assume that somebody else has validated the data. And we don't even have a wallet. We want to know about everything. Um, and so kind of just using kind of the straight node without any modification doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, on top of that, you could use some sort of database, take any one of pre-existing uh, database products and just dump all the data into there. Um, and, and people have done that before, and it worked pretty reasonably well when the blockchain, like four or five years ago, um, there was, uh, uh, I think Bitcoin AB was the first thing I ran into that did this. Um, and they would parse all the data from the blockchain, throw it in your choice of back end, and, and then let you access it. But it got really slow. Um, using an external database, relational database server is, is, has a lot of costs to it. There's communication costs with the process. There's kind of explosions in your, in your data size, since these are all pretty, these are pretty general products, and so they can't really kind of take advantage of, of a lot of optimizations in terms of letting kind of details you know about the data really kind of optimize your, your program for your use case. Um, and you just can't get from it the kind of like low level optimizations that you can get when you're starting kind of with a system that, that only does what you want rather than a general purpose system. Um, so instead of these existing options, use BlockSci. <laughs> um, kind of we, we managed to get around the, the problems of various existing products. 
um, and and provide ways to uh, to accomplish all of all the goals I stated with a fair amount of ease. <gasps> so uh, what can Blocksci do? Well, one thing Sarf mentioned is very rapidly iterate over transactions. Um, one of the initial use cases that we wanted was just to be able to look at every single transaction and figure something out about it. Um, count the number of addresses of different types. Um, count the number of, uh, count the total output value in a block, for each block. Essentially just simple queries that you can do over the blockchain. And basically all of those at, at this point, as, as Arvin was saying, can be done in you know, one or two seconds. Um, and, and the thing about Bitcoin is there are a lot of unknowns. Most of the time, we don't know what questions we want to ask. And we're going to need to refine the question 100 times before we ask it in the right way. And so you really don't want something where you're going to have to sit back and run it overnight every time you tweak your query. You really want something where you can sit at a live computer and, and try out a bunch of different things and see what works. And so I find it really important that you can really kind of get at this stuff uh, easily and quickly. Um, one effect this has on block size, so sequential iteration, very fast. Random iteration, a lot slower. It's still very fast, and it's still faster than other products. Um, but, and I have some performance numbers later. It's about 30 times slower. Uh, so a lot of times when using block size, it's helpful to kind of think if there is some way you can frame the question you want to ask as something you could do via sequential iteration over the transactions. Um, and we kind of achieve all this by really optimizing for data locality. And this is a bit of a lower level point. But essentially, all of the transaction data is right there together on disk. And so you can really let the, the kernel and your, the computer, and, and without really doing much, optimize for, for this sequential iteration. And it will just predict what data you need to access and have it in there before you even do. Is your random access faster than the RPC access on the blockchain? I haven't compared the two, but I, I, out of hand, I'm just going to answer yes, because, yeah. You can use the power of block explorer itself. Yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, we don't have anything released for that. I did, just for fun, whip up a little kind of internal beta of a block explorer, and it was, yeah, um, certainly faster. Um, so kind of a, a little bit, yeah, lower level details of, of how we achieve this, what kind of stuff block size doing in the back end. Um, this is kind of just a, a small snippet of the uh, kind of conceptual, the conceptual data model that BlockSci is using, and, and a little bit of how it's laid out on disk. Um, so, kind of, if you know Bitcoin, there's kind of a logical way that that Bitcoin breaks down. You have blocks; they contain transactions. Those transactions have inputs and outputs. Um, those the in outputs contain uh, the address that the output is going to, um, and so each uh, each of kind of these. Oh my. Transaction is, is lost the N. <laughs> um, but each of these things um, is kind of contained, nested together. A transaction on disk just contains the data for its inputs and outputs. There's just a chunk of 100 bytes that gets loaded up, and all the transactions are just contiguously laid out. And so when your computer is going over them, it can just very easily go through this. We have an entirely separate address module. And each of the address types has data particular to it. So for a pay to pub key hash address, we just store the pub key. For a, pay to, for a pay to script hash address, we store the hash of the script along with kind of the address that is contained within it. Uh, for multisig, we, we store the, rel the contained addresses, so what the set of addresses you're, uh, you're sending to is and how many of that, what, su what size subset are required. Uh, so essentially, like, we, we kind of capture all of this data and it's all laid out in this very similar contiguous method um, that allows us to really optimize for speed. Um, we also, it's, it's, as I said, the random access is not quite as fast, but I, I would still say you can rapidly traverse objects. Um, so essentially, there's, there's, very, uh, there's very seamless exp exploration through the transaction graph. If we have a transaction and we want to look at one of the outputs of it, and get the transaction that spends that output. All you need to do is, is outputs uh, of a certain given output dot spending tx. Um, if you have an input, you can, you can get the tx that it's spending. Um, if you have an output, you can also get the, uh, the address. Um, internally, this is, very this is very simple. Each of these objects is given, an, is given an ID, and an ID just corresponds to an offset in, the fi in a file. So there's no external indexes. There's no kind of extra bulk. 
basically like any sort of lookup you want to do on anything in particular is just going to be one or two reads uh, to, to the backing data files. And you can convert our normal addresses into your index addresses that you're using. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's, it, it's, it's, a sli it's a slightly slower component, but there's just a simple, we use uh, RocksDB, which is a fork of LevelDB by Facebook, um, as, a, as a lookup table to store those. So it's not quite as fast as the rest of it, but it, it's, again, it's fast enough that you won't notice uh, speed difference. Um, so just kind of a, a little look of, of how this would work, uh, the, this kind of data layout works in the case of transactions is, uh, well, transactions are kind of arbitrary length since you don't know how many inputs or outputs there are. But the TX data file itself is just a lot of, tra a lot of transactions, all their data. And then when you look up, I want to see transaction 100, there's an index file, it gets an offset. You go in there, you get a transaction, and there you go. Uh, so essentially, like, the whole, the whole back end of the analysis tool is, is extremely simple. And uh, we haven't done it, but you could entirely implement this in other programming languages as well if uh, you were interested. Um, most of the complexity, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, is in the parser that generates this data. Um, so one thing that you really want from a blockchain analysis tool is to provide a live interface on the data. So of course, you, the blockchain is, is constantly growing. New, blocks are con new transactions are being broadcast. New blocks are coming into your node. Uh, that's being appended. And you want some way to kind of support that in your system. You want to be able to keep updating your data and you want to, to kind of be able to, if I start up a new BlockSci instance and open the, the and create a blockchain object, I want it to be up to date. Um, but you also don't want the data ch changing under your feet. So once I've started up an instance, I don't want suddenly like, the results of queries to change because that would be really confusing and, and create all sorts of trouble. Um, and we want to be able to have a computer running multiple instances at once. It would be kind of unfortunate if we were limited to only a single user using the uh, using kind of block site at once per computer. Um, and as you'll see during uh, during the workshop, you can easily uh, support many, many, many users running at once uh, without really any issues. Um, and so these these various properties might seem kind of contradictory. How do new instances always have the latest data, while old instances keep a static image? Um, it, it, it seems a little odd, but uh, we do this through uh, this, this technique kind of that, that we're calling the, uh, the snapshot illusion. And what that means is for all instances of block size, the data is always up to date, but we know how to fake it so it looks like it's not. Um, when you look at a transaction and you want to see whether it's been spent, well, if it's been spent by, uh, in a block that's later than the current loaded height, we can hide that. And so essentially, the set of ways that old data changes is very, very small. The blockchain is mostly append only, or I should say block, the blockchain is entirely append only. Blockchain's data format is mostly append only. And so the places it's not, we can just kind of dynamically hide it. If you're fast, you'll at most get two or three blocks extra. You know, if you're doing a query, if you're fast enough. Yeah. I understand. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so the so the currently loaded chain will not see the new blocks come in. Um, in any case, you are very fast, so you won't. Your any query will not take more than half an hour. I guess, right? Yeah. And so you will have at most three blocks if you're talking the Bitcoin blockchain. Oh sure. Well, I guess. Um, I mean, normally, uh, so so the actual interface is we use uh, Jupyter Notebook, but it doesn't. So we keep a a, a, a permanently running uh, instance open, and so that instance will just be set at whatever block height it was started at. Uh, if you're using it in kind of a more scripting form, where, where it just loads it at the top of the script, then yeah, you, you, you wouldn't really notice it. It mostly has to do with, uh, kind of it, from a research perspective, a lot of the time you want to have your data open, you want to play with it, you want to keep using it, um, so you're going to have it open over the long term. Uh, so now just a little about how all of this comes to be. Uh, so Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Core serializes its data to disk. It does it very similarly to how it's transferred over the network, basically equivalently. And that is not a very effective format if, you're not, if you don't have the goals of Bitcoin Core. Uh, it's optimized for, for the purposes that, that that is made for, and it's not analytics. Uh, so BlockSci has a, a parser that it has two modes, disk and RPC. 
using Bitcoin, it uses the disk mode. Essentially, that's the difference between directly taking the block files on disk and parsing them and connecting to the RPC and parsing the, the JSON output of that, uh, which in the case of, of the Bitcoin blockchain would, again, be infeasibly slow because of the RPC interface. Uh, but for smaller blockchains like, like Dash or um, like Zcash, that data is, is a lot quicker to get through. Um, so block size parser, it's, it's, it's highly optimized. It can uh, parse the whole Bitcoin blockchain. I think it takes about uh, 10 or 12 hours if you're uh, running block size locally on a machine with enough memory to, to load up the whole blockchain. Uh, it also is incrementally updating. So once you've initialized a node, it will be able to continually add blocks on. Our, we're currently the, uh, the AWS image that we released once an hour. Uh, the parser runs for, I think it's a couple minutes currently, and fully updates to the latest block. Um, and so that provides a really nice, uh, nice experience enabled by the parser. Um, if you have a subtlety blockchain, it's just like say, one field added up. You know, can, can the disk parser work with that? The disk parser is, is very particularly made for, for Bitcoin. Um, it certainly would be open to adding disk parser support for other altcoins. There hasn't really been a reason to yet since there's not much else that is on the scale of Bitcoin. Uh, but it, it's fairly easy to modify. Um, and the RPC parser can essentially work as long as you have your, your coin has an RPC client which has the fields that, that match up with Bitcoin Core. Yeah, uh, all fields are same. Like yeah, if you're using the RPC parser, that's not a problem at all. And for instance, our, our Zcash support is, is, is kind of just on the public side of Zcash. Zcash also has some other data, uh, but it just gets ignored uh, relating to private transactions. Um, so kind of just to, to, to demonstrate that the, the parser, that a lot goes on in the parser, uh, here's kind of a, a very simplified diagram of how the disk parser works. Uh, so it's dependent on the Bitcoin Core node or, or whatever. Uh, it also, work, for instance, the disk parser works on Litecoin uh, since it uses the same format. Uh, so the B Bitcoin Core node saves the blocks to disk. Um, then the parser itself uh, deserializes those blocks into memory, uh, calculates uh, various, calculates transaction hashes, uh, block hashes. Um, normalizes the UTXOs and the blockchain. Uh, normally, an input just says, I'm spending that output. It doesn't actually say what that output is. Um, whereas, if you're looking at it, you really want to know. Um, so it does that normalization. Uh, it does address normalization, which is uh, it notices, hey, both this output and that output were sent to the same address. Um, and so then it can, and, and then it can very easily uh, let blocks I uh, note that those are the same address and, and tell the user that those are the same address. Uh, and then it, it serializes all of this data to disk. Um, so that's kind of a, a very quick. Uh, and so essentially, the incremental part is it'll take the TX data file, and it'll just throw on the bottom whatever new uh, transactions are involved. So performance, uh, this is my favorite part. It's really fast. Um, so we have both single-threaded and, and multi-threaded performance. Uh, over various figures. Um, you can see there's, there's very little difference between iterating over just the transaction headers. So let's say if you wanted to get the lock time of every transaction and iterating over inputs and outputs to. Okay, the entire yeah. <laughs> um, and iterating over inputs and outputs to, let's say, calculate the fee by getting the, the total output value and, or the total input value and subtracting the total output value. Um, and that's because of this contiguous data format. That's because when you're iterating over the whole chain, it's basically loading all of the data um, since it is so small and local. Um, and then you can see if we throw in multi-threading, it gets a hell of a lot faster. That's where we get our 1.1 second number from. Actually, this was done on, a, on an 8-core um, or 4-core instance, I think. Uh, it was done in half the number of cores that uh, were of the instance that we're uh, giving you today, and I actually tested this out, and it gets down to uh, to 0.62 seconds. Now, I've never seen any statistics saying that anyone can do the whole blockchain uh, like reading or something in like less than like, like tens of like yeah. Like um, so I don't know what the limits of of uh, multi-threading scaling this is, but at least uh, up to um, I think 16 cores, it's pretty linear. Um, so I think this could get even faster on, on more powerful machines. Python can be a little bit slower though, probably yeah. a few seconds, maybe five seconds. 
Yeah, yeah. Python, Python has a lot of overhead as a language. It's not surprisingly uh, yeah, a lot. You're driving a lot of your performance benefits in C++. Yeah, yeah. So all of these numbers are in C++. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, there's a whole lot of uh, optimizations that went into making the C++ performance fast. Um, thing, things like, uh, like um, making sure that everything can be inlined, that the actual code that executes this is incredibly simple. Like to basically eliminate any function calls and, and any kind of jumps. It, it's very, there's a lot that goes into making that fast. And we're currently in the process, like Arvind said, of trying to surface those, that performance in the, in the Python layer, um, where it's still quite fast, but just not at quite these levels. Um, so a little bit about the Python library. That's kind of the, how, I, how people should be using BlockSci. Um, and in locations where they can't currently use the Python library, we're working to make the Python library work for that. Um, all the API is available, so the only issues with it ever are performance. Uh, it was gener it's, uh, it's generated for this great library called uh, PyBind11 that lets you just kind of, it basically just in the back end directly calls the C++ library, um, but provides a much nicer and cleaner interface, and so it's a lot more intuitive to use and a lot easier to, to teach. Um, you get full access to the underlying data. Basically, any field on anything that could po is in the blockchain is available via um, BlockSci at this point in the case of Bitcoin, um, but suffers from, from somewhat slower performance. Uh, in order to kind of deal with that, we're exploring various different uh, access patterns and various different ways you can access data. Um, at the top, we have if you were to kind of dive in and, and specify kind of directly what you wanted to calculate. This is all, by the way, um, counting the number of transactions with a fee over 0.1 bitcoins in a given block. Um, in the first example, we're iterating over all the transactions in the block and then all the, uh, the inputs in the block and all the out summing all the inputs and outputs in the block and, and taking their difference. So, so doing it very, very much by hand. Um, and that would be quite slow. Essentially, the more objects it needs to create, the slower it is. And so we explore ways of minimizing the number of objects that need to be generated in Python. Um, at a higher level, there's a tx.fee method, um, which if you just call that, will be substantially faster um, since it doesn't need to go over all the inputs and outputs. Um, so kind of various functions we've exposed at higher abstraction levels in order to, in order to reduce the performance issues. Uh, we're also exploring a vectorized interface where there'll be block.fees, which just, and this, this is in there, you can, you can use it today, uh, which will just return a list of, of numbers, which are all fees for all the transactions in the blocks. Um, and uh, then there's also kind of a multi-threaded interface where it'll, well, actually multi-process multi interface because Python doesn't support multi-threading um, very well. And that will distribute over, let you distribute over multiple cores. Uh, so we're essentially exploring various access patterns. Um, we haven't yet hit exactly the the optimal way to do it yet, but it's it's we have some we have some ideas in the pipeline, uh, which we'll hopefully be implementing uh, fairly soon. Uh, so just some kind of interesting high level details of various features that that the library supports uh, addresses. And this all comes because uh, I don't know how much people know about the details of, of uh, how, how addresses work. But uh, to humans, they, most, client, most like, websites and clients and wallets will just display a string, which is your, your address string. Uh, but on the back end, there's, a, there's Bitcoin scripts, which is a scripting language. There's standard output, there's standard output script types. Um, what the main, the main few being, the main two being pay to uh, pub key hash and pay to script hash, like I said at the beginning, where your address begins with a one or a three. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole set of new ones that come along with SegWit, uh, which BlockSci also has full support for. Um, and so each of these needs to, BlockSci doesn't just let you, doesn't just keep, store the script for you. It actually interprets it, it extracts the relevant data uh, from it. And one kind of cool thing that it does with addresses is it, we introduced this notion of uh, and support for address equivalents. Uh, and there are, two, there are two types of, and I'm going to explain this, uh, but there are two types of equivalents that we support, uh, type equivalents and, and script equivalents. And I'll give you a little uh, example of what that means. Um, okay, I'm, I'm mostly on the screen. <laughs> so uh, here we have an example. We have three addresses. 
Uh, we have a pay to pubkey hash address at the top, a pay to witness pubkey hash down there, and a pay to script hash at the bottom. Uh, you, you hopefully will have seen these three address formats before. The top and the bottom are quite old. The pay to witness pubkey hash is uh, one of the newer address formats, uh, and that's using uh, uh, the, the, new, uh, the new finally decided way to, to encode those. Um, but the interesting thing about all of these is, well, first of all, the pay to pubkey hash address and the pay to witness pubkey hash address are actually backed by the exact same public key. Um, and so they are owned by the same person. This is not a, a heuristic clustering. This is the same public key controls both of those addresses. Uh, and and BlockSci lets you know that. If you, type, um, if you have an address and you type .equiv, it will give you a list of all of the equivalent addresses. Um, and so that's a really interesting thing to explore. And then the pay to script hash at the bottom uh, inside of it just contains that pay to witness pub key hash, uh, which is, um, oh, sorry, I flipped these two. Uh, this should say script equivalence on the bottom. Uh, since script equivalence we consider if you have a, a, script, a pay to script hash address and, a, and something inside of it, those two are really equivalent. You need the same piece of information to spend both of them. And then type equivalence is if we have two addresses, but they're really both sent to the same pub key, uh, then we consider those type equivalent. And BlockSci has, uh, in the newest version, we added support for all of that. Uh, and there's some really kind of, there's, there's some fun stuff you can find on the blockchain. For instance, you can find uh, people with, who use multi-sig addresses, who use them uh, pre-segwit with regular pay to script hash and post-segwit with a segwit pay to script hash wrapped in a regular pay to script hash. Uh, so the whole thing can get kind of messy. Uh, but BlockSci at least makes that as, as easy as possible to understand. Um, and I think kind of nicely demonstrates how, how BlockSci does a really deep dive into understanding blockchain data. It doesn't, start at the, doesn't stop at the surface level. Most block explorers these days will treat these as completely distinct addresses. They may each have their own balance, uh, which kind of sucks. Uh, and you really, you really want kind of to treat these as a unit, and BlockSci lets you do that. Uh, the, let's see, we have the heuristics module. Uh, so this kind of gets to the, the started uh, at the end of Arvind's talk, a little of the discussion of uh, how does how does BlockSci kind of handle the um, how does BlockSci handle uh, identifying self churn? Uh, one of the things we do there is uh, is using uh, kind of basic heuristic clustering techniques. Um, this goes about there's as Arvind talked about there's the there's the joint input heuristic, which is pretty straightforward, which is just if there's a transaction with a couple inputs, uh, those inputs are probably spent by the, uh, we're probably uh, controlled by the same person, unless it's a coin join, and we, and we can detect and exclude those. Um, but then there's change addresses, and change addresses are a lot more interesting. And there's a lot of different ways to, to kind of decide what, a, what, a change, what the change address for a transaction is. Um, if you're just using Bitcoin, your, your wallet will generate an address, and it will send you your change. It will probably be a fresh address if you're using a good wallet. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's, there's a good shot that it's identifiable, though. Uh, so just kind of some, I, I th we have, yeah, I think we have eight, uh, or well, seven main heuristics and then one legacy one. Um, one example is, is a peeling chain that a lot of times they'll, you'll have a, a large amount of coins sitting in one uh, address, and they'll want to send it to a lot of people. And so I send a small amount, I take the rest as change. I send another small amount, I take the rest as change. Well, you can probably assume that the large chunk is, uh, is, is continues to be controlled by the same owner. Um, there's a uh, change by power of 10 value. A lot of times if I'm sending coins to somebody, I'm going to choose a round number because it, it's nicer that way. Uh, but change addresses are not going to be that way because they're just going to be whatever's left over. So a lot of times the, if there's only one output that doesn't have a nice number, there's a good shot that's the change address. Um, change by, uh, what's a fun one? Change by lock time. Here we get into kind of wallet specific behaviors. Bitcoin Core, for instance, uses this lock time field in a transaction, uh, whereas many other wallets do not. And so if only one, if we can essentially detect that a transaction has, was created by a given wallet and only one of its outputs was spent in a transaction created by that same type of wallet, uh, we can assume that the chances are very high that those are connected. So that's just a few examples of kind of different, uh, different heuristics that you could use there in order to detect this self churn. Um, yeah? Couldn't you use the de-excavation software at the time? <laughs> yeah, um, we, we haven't done it yet, but that's 100% that's um, an interesting thing to explore. I think it'd be a little harder, um, just because 
you need to, unless you have historical data on what the mempool looked there, essentially you need to figure out how they were calculating it um, and reverse engineer that, but it would totally work. Um, and there's, I think some of the, I think kind of various uh, private companies uh, may have spent a little more time working on kind of that. That's a, that's a big project, um, but you could totally use that. Um, but uh, one, one fun thing about these different methods is that they're sometimes contradictory, that they will, these heuristics will tell you different things. Uh, so Blockside doesn't make kind of a decision for you. It just makes all of these available. And you can choose for yourself which one you prefer. Um, and as new heuristics come along, we'll throw those into. Uh, so Blockside essentially doesn't want to really make decisions for you. It just wants to give you all the options and then let you decide. Um, other things that we can do via heuristics, uh, coin join identification. Uh, there's a whole lot of different ways you can identify a, a coin join transaction where uh, n people get together and each send in an input and get a random output uh, in order to hide uh, which output they control. Um, and and BlockSci can detect those, uh, for instance, for the shared input heuristic so that it could ignore them. Um, it can do other stuff, fun stuff. Uh, Arvin mentioned in his talk, uh, the, the, multi, the situation where, where a multi-sig goes from, uh, from where coins go from a multi-sig address to a, to a normal address and then back to multi-sig. Another thing that we looked at was a multi-sig uh, key set change, where you have an input multi-sig with some set of addresses and then an output with the same set of addresses except one swapped out. Um, and so for instance, and, and so our heuristics module lets you find all transactions that match that, that pattern. Uh, so essentially, like we have code in there for. So when you're clustering, uh, what what are the points around which you're clustering? Like what are the axes around which you're clustering? What other ways does it? No, I mean like for instance, when you cluster, you cluster around certain uh, like the, around around the, the change number. Yeah. 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 The change. Number. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we that we, we, have, we that's still we have we haven't kind of we haven't spent a huge amount of time exploring the different effects of heuristics on that um, right. currently. Uh, we use uh, what is in here is actually is the, the legacy heuristic, uh, because it's how we started. And that is if you've read the, the paper Fistful of Bitcoins uh, by Sarah Michael John, which kind of started the whole uh, heuristic clustering uh, movement a, a bunch of years ago. Uh, it's the heuristics that she describes um, with some small modifications. Uh, so a little bit about the address clustering itself. Um, so it's built on top of BlockSci. It's a great demonstration of what you can do with BlockSci. Uh, it's, an ex it's an external library. Uh, it's usable and it ships with the, with the main core of BlockSci, but I, I treat it as a, as a nice demonstration of how you can build tools on top. Um, so as I said, it applies these two heuristics. Uh, it uses a disjoint set algorithm to kind of combine different addresses that it marks as connected. But the really cool part about it is it runs in five minutes. It's really fast. Um, and so it can give you the ability to, to try out different techniques, if you don't like the result of the clustering, then you can try something new. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's a great demonstration of how you can do <coughs> things really, really quickly. Um, so just uh, kind of to draw all these pieces together, and I'm just wrapping up uh, pretty soon. Got one section left. Um, the, uh, so the kind of the pieces I've talked about, we have the block side parser, which generates uh, kind of data in our optimized format. Uh, we have the BlockSci library in C++ that, that maps that data into memory that kind of gives you objects to manipulate that data um, and help understand it. And then we have the BlockSci Python module uh, that provides a nice access layer in Python that lets you uh, do your real work. Uh, and now just kind of a, a quick example of, of kind of one, one fun thing we've done with BlockSci. Um, and that's understanding the, uh, the block space market. So, you may you, like so generally their blocks have a max size. You may have heard there's been some debates over this uh, whether it should change, um, and in a lot of cases we have been at the point where the network is saturated, uh, where blocks are completely full and miners have to make a choice as to which transactions they want to include, uh, and so we wanted to take a look at at kind of how those decisions were being made, um, and one thing we found was that miners are not making kind of, if, if you call an optimal block, a block that's including all transactions, that's maximizing revenue, that's including the most valuable transactions, miners aren't doing that. Um, and so we wanted to ask, why aren't miners doing this? Are, are they, maybe they're leaving money on the table? It's, we wanted to, we wanted to understand it more. Um, and so how do we go about that? Well, first we kind of figured out our methodology. Um, we recorded the mempool over time. 
so that we could kind of have at least an estimate of what a given miner was seeing when they created their block. It's not perfect. We can't know exactly what they saw, but we can at least get a pretty good guess. Um, based on that, we generated what we, would con what we considered an <coughs> optimal block. Uh, so essentially, we, we wrote up a library that, uh, that built a block out of a set of, of uh, transactions. Uh, we accounted for things like child pays for parent, so kind of we took at least a, we, we tried to account for as much as we could. We made sure that these were valid blocks that we were creating. Uh, and then we found the transactions that occurred in the real blocks that didn't occur in our blocks and, uh, and, and reduced it to just the transactions that clearly didn't have anywhere near the fee that they needed to be included. Um, and here's just one example of, uh, of, in, in, uh, of what we found uh, comparing kind of just two blocks. And so we can see in orange uh, on the right, we have things that we agreed on. And not surprisingly, the, the most valuable transactions, we have value on the x-axis, the most valuable transactions everybody included. Um, but where the differences lie is that in the miners block, there are that, there's that whole tail on the left side of really transactions that were, that were way lower value than the bulk of the block. Uh, whereas in our optimal block, we include what you would expect, just the next lower value transactions. Um, so that was kind of weird. Uh, so we set about trying to understand that. Uh, we had this set of transactions now. Um, over our two-week collection period, we found uh, 2,148 transactions with suspiciously low fees. This isn't a huge amount. There's, there's, miners are mostly acting sensibly. Um, but we wanted to dig into the 2,000 is enough that it's, that it's non-negligible. It's interesting to talk about. So we wanted to dive into that. And we found a few kind of ex possible explanations. Uh, and we could categorize the transactions that we thought were suspect by various, in, in various ways. Uh, 770 had high priority. Uh, that's an old concept in Bitcoin. It essentially helps you set, spend old coins if you had a very old dust output. Essentially, it uses coin age, which is how long a coin has been sitting there, in order to prioritize your transaction. And so it was a nice thing that miners did in order to help people spend their old coins. Um, it was actually removed from Bitcoin Core, which is why it's somewhat surprising that so many miners, and it had been removed before we did the study, so it's somewhat surprising that so many miners were still using it. Uh, but that seemed like a very probable reason for, most of, for many of those. Um, 634 were a very interesting set. These were zero fee and not seen by our node. Uh, and, and our guess on those is essentially, and we know publicly, we know some of these exist, these are Third, these are relationships that people have with miners where they, send the mi they pay the, mon the miner kind of in, not on the blockchain, send them a transaction with zero fee, and then have them put it in the blockchain. Um, yes? Did you then incorporate any kind of like address or ownership clustering in combination with that to see like, um, these are people that are repeatedly doing that? We played around a little. Uh, we didn't find a ton. Um, but I think if we collected data over a longer period, um, we could cer we'd certainly consider uh, expanding that study. Um, and so that's another explanation, is this kind of, and, and it's an interesting explanation because it makes it um, difficult to really understand the block fee market and the block space market. Uh, since if there is this whole other layer uh, where people are getting paid in other ways, then we don't really have any insight on that. And it also means that it's very difficult to know how the, what the proper fee is. Essentially, like it distorts everything. And it also leaves the question, why are people doing this at all? Why is it not a better decision to just set a fee and broadcast it to the network? What are the advantages of this? Do you think that it's affiliates? Um, affiliates? I think it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think some of it, it's a great way to guarantee that your transaction will get into a block if you really care about time. Um, some, some businesses might like uh, kind of having existing relationships with miners uh, so that they can just pay them one huge chunk of money and then guarantee their transactions they'll get in, that might work better for them. Um, we haven't really like, gotten much uh, external insight on this, so I can't really speak a ton to, to why. Um, yeah? Do you have any idea which miners were mining those transactions? Because sometimes they label. Yeah, um, yeah no, the, the, um, there were, um, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head, there were, uh, we talked about it in the Blockside white paper, um, which Arvin mentioned. Uh, there were a couple miners that, that definitely uh, did that more than others. 
And also, just to clarify, some of the miners who are doing this, who are kind of getting paid on the side, find blocks like what, once a day, twice a day, something yeah. like that. So their clients somehow seem to be willing to wait a long time to get their transaction into the blockchain by having that you know, relationship with a particular miner instead of sending it out to the whole network. So it's pretty confusing to us that some of you know what's going on. <laughs> you could have some miners adopting a sus subscription fee model rather than a transaction fee. Oh. Right? You know, Amazon versus Netflix. Yeah. And just economic line models. Well, there's some uh, big miners that offer for, for like doing their transaction to mine by the domain. Cool. Um, just to wrap up there, uh, 411 were sweep transactions. This, these are where miners have, have uh, kind of, what, miners are happy to incentivize that people consolidate outputs. And so if you have 100 outputs and combine them all into a single uh, output in a single transaction, uh, then, then some miners uh, might have mercy on you and let that in at a drastically lower amount of fee than you, uh, than you would otherwise have to pay. Um, but still, 802 of the, of the original uh, 2100 were unexplained. Um, we couldn't explain it through any of, any of these explanations, which is pretty weird. Yeah? Didn't BitFury do a stunt where they mined a bunch of low-fee transactions or no-fee transactions? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, I remember yeah. that from a year or two ago. Okay, well, this was collected um, uh, like six months ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Did you try to uh, force out like spam transactions in terms of the um, well, we, we didn't try to parse out spam transactions, but um, yeah, but it, like it would have to be spam generated by the miners, um, since the mi these are this, these are what the miner chose to include in their blocks, and we verified that there were better transactions available. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then, just uh, yeah, takeaways from the talk: um, block size, low-level optimizations enable a really fast and easy-to-use high-level interface. Uh, it likes to. It takes care of a lot of annoying low-level stuff and and tries to provide kind of the most the cleanest, uh, most intuitive interface possible, um, and it doesn't just give you kind of access to raw blockchain data like the RPC interface might, but it, it instead kind of interprets that data and tries to present present kind of the cleanest, nicest face on it possible. Um, yeah. You said uh, each block size is using the snapshot engine. Yeah. But it's actually so. Yeah. Um, not particularly. It wouldn't. It would. It would essentially. It would cause too many problems by creating data inconsistency. We might add that. In. It would be very easy well, to add I'm, in. I'm wondering if I could yeah. like use block size back end for web app. Um, yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, I think it's not currently supported, but it would be pretty easy to add in. So I, I could certainly uh, imagine adding that. Um, yeah. The reason we didn't was because when you have a reorg, you're going to get inconsistent data. Right. So if you, right, if you have a web yeah, app. Yeah, I understand for majority of analytical re like cool. use cases, you'll have the, you, you want yeah. a snapshot, but yeah. there's you know, some some use cases that I can think of where I have Exactly. Time. For your use case, yeah. it seems perfectly fine. So we could add that in. That's, that's a good feature. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 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 All of your data was basically on chain. You were talking about mempool yeah. uh, check too. Is that also being collected? Um, there, there, there's a there's a there, there's a module in in uh, that comes along with Blockside that lets you track uh, mempool data. Uh, so like we, we the only thing we've used it for so far is is that analysis, um, and that was required because you had to be able to estimate what the miner had saw when it created that block. Did you also track the events like reorgs and stuff? Um, not not particularly. Um, I don't think any happened during the period of time we were looking at. Um, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I think the question is, do we have historical reorg data? Is that, is that what you were asking? Well, that would be the expanded question, but I, whether or not you even captured the events itself would be interesting. Um, not currently. Um, Blockside mostly ignores reorg data. It's very there's no global store of of reorg data. It's essentially just that if you, the longer you are when you are running a node, uh, reorgs will be captured in the no, in the data recorded by that node. Uh, currently, they're ignored by BlockSci. Uh, it's on the enhancements uh, request list to add some way to access that data, but it, it's not in there yet. Well, if you have very old data stored and collected over time, you have all the indications of a lot of reorgs, too, um, that you could use for analysis. 
Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's just we haven't we haven't done it yet because the programming abstractions that we use so far assume a linear chain, and so we would have to update the interface significantly. But you're right, we could do that. Cool. Um, so I guess now we uh, <laughs> on yeah we take a yeah take a short break I guess um, and then uh, Malta is gonna take over and. Uh, Start into kind of a tutorial on on uh, actually using yeah actually using Boxi. Uh, so thanks. <laughs>